Tuesday o'clock. It is Tuesday night. Do you know where your DJ's at? I know where I'm at, and I'm here with you. It's another week, another beautiful DJ roundtable here on Twitch. If you're watching on Twitch, please make sure that you, uh, you know, in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're at, if you're not a regular. And if you're new to here on Twitch, welcome. Other than that, also, we got people coming in and out. Uh, unfortunately, we do have one DJ down tonight. They have a gig, uh, but we have plenty of other DJs here. And uh, we got one coming in now. I got another one going back in a second or two. And uh, we'll go out with the show in a minute. But before we do that, do me a favor. You haven't done so already. Make sure you go to all these guys' social <laughs> media. I have links down below to all their YouTube channels. So make sure you go to the YouTube channels and subscribe to the YouTube channels. And watch their videos. They have a lot of great stuff. Jeff has great gigs. Uh, Dwayne does. Brentley always has great stuff. Uh, Tommy has great stuff as well. Uh, and, of course, Matt and myself. I have some great stuff to uh, always watch, gig logs and shorts and so forth. But when you're watching this on YouTube, do me a favor when you're there. Make sure you click that thumbs up icon. That helps the algorithm so much. That's not even funny. It helps us build more people to see it. And then... Just make sure that you click on also to subscribe and make sure the bell is turned on so you know when I drop a new episode. Today was a little bit late just because the fact that uh, it is tax season, which is one of the things we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And also the other part of it is uh, because I've been busy and busy and busy. Uh, a lot of wedding shows. So with that said, let's co continue out the show and have some fun here and some great stuff again. Uh, now we got everyone here for tonight. Glad to see everyone here. Glad everyone we'll make it. Everyone's alive. And uh, Jeff, did you get any of the rain or anything like that from that uh, storm that went through and went up north and dumped snow? Yeah, just a little bit of rain. Not much. Mm -hmm. it, was to, it was supposed to rain all day yesterday, and it didn't. So, no, nah, just average. Okay. I know some areas got some good amount of rain. And California got some good rain, too. <laughs> Saw that. Okay. Um, so you know, right now in the Midwest, we're we're good. Uh, but uh, I know the, the, you guys on the East Coast and West Coast had to get a little bit of rain, a little bit of moisture. And uh, further north from you, they got some snow up there. Boston got hit with a little bit and New York City and so forth. They got hit with a uh, few inches of snow. So hopefully if you're watching from up there, from uh, like Mike is in northeastern Pennsylvania, hopefully you didn't get too much. I heard uh, 10, 12 inches in your area, Mike. I'm not. That's what the news said. I don't know what they had. Uh, he says you got six. That's a good amount of snow. And like, like I told you the other day, you should have a snowblower, not just your son. <laughs> With that said, let's start the show. And again, like, like I said before, I started off with uh, one of the reasons why I'm a little bit late. It is getting into tax season. Don't forget April 15th. It's the same date every year, unless there's a uh, falls on a holiday or something that taxes are due. Always talk to a tax professional about taxes. This is not about any information to uh, basically uh, for your taxes. I'm not giving any tax information. So don't come and ask me, how do you do this? How do you apply for that? What's a 1099 or something like that? I am not a tax expert. What I'm telling you is what I do and hopefully what else does and share some information, how they prepare for tax season. What are some of the things that they're doing? Uh, one of the things that we've been doing, and we started basically a few weeks ago, my wife and I, is separating all the bills. Because, again, you should be collecting your bills throughout the year for everything you're paying for and separating them. And then we have now in the separate piles for each individual area. And Tracy was do, actually doing a spreadsheet to get the amounts there. And this also gives you a nice thing to look back at and review how much you're spending on things. You know, how many... How many hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars you spend on advertisement? How much money or thousands of dollars you spend on a vehicle? How much mileage do you do if you, if you don't have a business vehicle, you're using a personal vehicle? Um, what are you looking at with certain things? And that's that's one of the things when we prepare for tax and for tax season, we start way in advance and getting stuff ready. And I would definitely tell you that anytime you're doing taxes, doesn't matter if you have a tax professional preparing for it or you have yourself doing it, you're doing software, whatever you decide to do, 
make sure you have receipts for everything, keep everything together, and make sure if you have a tax professional, ask them what they need and give them everything they need. And if they say, hey, you have any receipts for anything else, give them everything and explain to them this is everything you have. But do it organized, put everything together. If you're not sure, you can go to the IRS's website and look at where you can put different areas, different uh, paperwork in it for different piles for, you know, one for, you know, food and uh, food and board and one for rental and one for maintenance for a vehicle, so forth, so on, depending on what your tax are. So make sure you talk to a tax professional and get that taken care of. So I'm going to start with DJ Brentley there, who is, you know, again, we're all small business people here. Um, what are some of the things you do to prepare for tax season that's coming up? Well, I got real lucky years ago, and this is when I was still living in Chicago and working for the last owner of the Hartley Cap family of Line Tap. He was an accountant. And with that, he showed me some tricks, or not necessarily tricks, he just said, this is what I do, so I can, you know, at the end of the year, just go click on each total and send it to my accountant. So once a week, every Monday morning, I take out all the receipts from the business, you know, like what I've done for the weekend, be it gas, hotels, meals, the whole nine yards, and I will enter them into my spreadsheet, which, you know, like a straight up financial ledger. So I've got, you know, checking savings, my due dates and all that, and my checklist to make sure I pay all my bills on time because I don't do the auto pay thing in case anything goes wrong on my end. So I don't start getting dinged uh, for, you know, over fees and all that. But I keep track of everything week to week. So when it comes the last week of December or the last, you know, January 2nd or 3rd, I can literally just take those totals, put them in a, open, a regular spreadsheet that says this is all my expenditures for the year, and then from there, when I used to use an accountant, and that was until 2018, I would, you know, literally pay attention to every line item they're doing and really have them explain it to me. So when I finally started doing my own in 2019, I knew what I, I really just copied what they did basically into the new form with my current info for 2019. And before I send it, I've got a really good friend back home in Chicago. And I'm like, can you just glance this once? He's like, yeah. And he's like, you didn't miss anything. You're good to go. Cool. And so since then, I've kind of been sending it to him to get that done. And I granted this last year was a little bit expensive. Most I've made DJing in a while. So it, yeah, my tax, I think I spent my, what do you call it? Oh, money owed to the IRS is like almost $8,000. Get down with it. You're, you're, yeah. you're, uh, you're, uh, Customer service ma manager there is uh, yeah. trying to make sure that you uh, you uh, make sure that uh, they're taken care of uh, financially as well. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, my my accountant even told me how to write my dogs off and why. I'm like, oh, security, great idea. Why didn't I think of that? And because I have two levels of the house that have two separate entrances, I keep now I keep one dog on each floor, and that completely covers that problem. So I'm, with my insurance, my insurance rates are actually cheaper because I have two dogs. Well, there you go. And again, this is something that, like I said before, make sure you talk to your tax, yeah. your tax professional because it always varies from person to person to person. And state to state also has different things for state income tax. And also you want to make sure you're following all the laws because you don't want to be audited. Auditing is not being fun. So speaking of another person who's got to get their taxes ready, Jeff over there in beautiful North Carolina. Jeff, what are some of the things you do to get ready for your taxes to uh, lessen the burden and headaches when you have to go and do them? Uh, well, pretty much what everybody else does. I'm, I'm in maybe a little bit different situation than than your typical DJ, but, um, you know, I, um, I I do the the – the normal things, you know, uh, just this, let's see, yeah, last week, um, uh, met with, uh, met with my guy. He's our financial advisor. He's not necessarily a tax advisor, but, uh, you know, so we, we have to, um, you know, meet with him once a year and figure out, you know, different Roth IRAs and, you know, different things going on with that. But, uh, 
but uh, so you know i'm a little different from maybe your standard dj in that uh you know i have a another full-time job and uh so that's where my main concern is and uh so yeah but you know the normal things you know looking at receipts looking at expenditures and you know keeping track standard and that's stuff what that's one of the things because you also have your regular job, you get a normal W-2, you pay into the taxes through your regular employer, employer. It's one of the things that this is why talking to a tax professional is important because not everyone does this full time. Like, you know, Tracy works for a company and she has her W-2s and then I do this full time. She does it part time. And it's one of the things that every di everything is different. So always, always, always talk to people, do things, make sure you follow the letter of the law. Again, uh, you want to make sure that you take care of everything. Do not get yourself caught in a catch-22. Talk to a tax professional. Uh, but this is, again, this is for us how, to get, how we get prepared for tax season. So next person I'm going to go to is probably the youngest person here, probably done taxes a few times. Tommy, who is from originally from the Chicago area, who happens to be in the great white north of Wisconsin, um, who's a little close to a little close to Green Bay. Hopefully he doesn't rub off on him. He's still a Bears fan. And I know he's a White Sox fan. And by the way, White Sox, they report tomorrow, but they are there today. They have everyone but one catcher I mean, one pit, well, yeah, one catcher is there, not there today, but they have a lot of pitchers and catchers there already. I saw in the news, so it is really, really great to see uh, baseball season starting up soon. That's the the boys of summer are coming. So, with that said, uh, what do you usually do to get uh, ready for taxes um, for yourself? Uh, so I collect all my forms. I've got a lot of W-9 forms through independent, uh, like contractor work. So certain uh, venues and. Um, places usually if it's like a school or some sort of an organization they'll make me fill one of those out um so i keep those all together and then i also have my w-2 which is just for my uh part-time job that i worked over the summer um i get all those together as well as i try to keep receipts like you were saying earlier on all the uh expenses i had throughout the year so equipment purchases or uh, other uh work that like for example the the dance that I had to do two weeks ago, I had to subcontract a uh, production company to come in and do lights and sounds. So like that invoice and receipt will be in there with the taxes. And then I just pass that on to my dad who uh, manages like the family taxes as well. So. And that's the important stuff is making sure that you have those, all those receipts. Uh, we have a couple things in the chat. Um, First thing first, uh, <laughs> we got someone saying, dang, I'm a very good dog. So dog, I said dogs are great. Um, and then Fred, laws <laughs> Fred said he wanted to buy a, a vehicle for the DJ business. I have done this. I actually have had multiple vehicles for the business. I own a vehicle that is only used for the business. DJ Brentley's got a van. He only uses it for the business. Um, I'm not sure anyone else here has... A, a business only vehicle. I think everyone else here has a personal vehicle they also use for the business. Uh, first, owning a vehicle for the business, it, again, everything you do for the vehicle, and again, you need to talk to a tax professional, but everything you do for the vehicle, you can write off more so than a personal vehicle. Personal vehicle, you usually get mileage versus on a business run vehicle, it is different. So I would definitely talk to a person. Before you buy it, pay a few bucks, talk to an accountant, say, hey, I want to buy a vehicle, whatever vehicle it is. Doesn't matter, it's a Yugo or it's a, like I have a Sprinter. Uh, talk to a tax professional and understand what you're getting into. One of the things that I can say, and again, you can double check this, always double check what I'm saying here, because uh, again, I'm not a tax professional. You can depreciate the vehicle over time or take a one lump sum payment. Again, talk to a tax professional. They'll explain that to you, but I do have a business vehicle and it does um, change how taxes are done. So make sure you do everything right. Talk to those tax people and, you know, make sure you find out the information from them. And then uh, let's see, does anyone, anyone check to see if they need to make an end of year purchase to lessen the tax burden? Um, that is uh that is something that uh, I don't usually do because throughout the year I'm buying stuff and have stuff. 
I, I don't know. Anyone here, is this a show of hands real quickly? Does anyone here look at where they're at with taxes at toward the end of the year and see they could buy something to write off for their business? Or does everyone just, as they go along the year, just buy, you know, they need a speaker or music or whatever they buy. They just go throughout the year buying stuff, right? Uh, Dwayne? I do a little bit. Yeah, I do a little bit. Um, Because being that always, teachers always buying stuff. So my um accountant always encouraged us to keep it like a receipt. And that lowers our um payment. And then we oh, used yeah. to do church. Yeah, we used to do the donations to the church, but I think Trump had ended all that. But like little stuff like that I do to um kind of like lower my um my taxes. Yeah, lower your exposure to taxes. And that's that's one of the things that <laughs> excuse me. Um even though I had a COVID a few weeks ago, I still get the COVID cough. I love it. Uh, <laughs> of course, you got to cough and laugh at the same time. Um, make sure you talk to a tax professional about that. Again, this is just how we prepare. And I'm going to go to Dwayne next, how he prepares. But make sure you talk to people uh, about that, about purchasing, if you need to do that, and see where you're at, where you're li tax liability with stuff. But again, this is why paying for a professional uh, it doesn't matter if it's H&R Block or if it's uh, John, the tax guy down the street, uh, someone who has been through it and understands it and knows the laws. Because, again, this is the legal stuff. And, again, that's why we're not giving out tax information without going to and talking to a tax professional. And I'm going to hit this home a bunch of times. You guys are going to get tired of me saying it, but a tax professional is a person you definitely want to talk to with this stuff. We're just telling you how we prepare and again, what you want you to do, this is something that is great questions and keep asking them and hopefully we'll tell you what we do. But ultimately, you're, I would definitely say talk to a, someone who does this all the time. Talk to an accountant, talk to someone who prepares taxes. Dwayne, again, you're you're just like Jeff, you have a regular job and then you do this on the side and you're just saying, you know, how you limit your exposure to taxes by you know, you used to donate. Now you buy some additional uh, equipment. Um, you look at where you're at and stuff like that. What are some of the other things you get ready for uh, for tax season? Basically, I try to buy everything from either using the same credit card or um, like PayPal or online. So something that's easily I can go back and track. And I have a spreadsheet where I have like um, stuff I bought for schoolwork. Um my subscription, music subscriptions, anything that has to do with DJing, like software um, subscriptions or um, software, just software in general, um, my record pools, um, equipment, and then also I put how much mileage I put on my car at the end. So I just try to put down everything because it's better to have more than you need and, the, and, and have them say no as opposed to not putting it there. You'd be like, oh, shoot, I should have added that. And that's, again, going back to that, like I said before, multiple times, they have that tax professional saying, hey, yeah, this is allowed, this is not allowed, this will get you in trouble. Having them there that knows the laws, every year the law changes, and Mike, you are correct, each day is different for tax laws. Some states have income tax, some states don't have income tax. Some states only income tax certain things, some things are a percentage. So, again, that's what it goes back into talking to someone who knows the laws, not just your state, but also knows the federal laws and can help you walk you through this um, to kind of get you, you know, in the right place. Because again, the last thing I want to see is someone get in any kind of trouble with uh, <laughs> with the government whatsoever. That's what the thing we don't want to do. We just want to make sure we try and prepare ourselves. And again, hopefully this is maybe if you got your paperwork sitting there, you're like, oh man, I got organized my paperwork. This will get you the ball rolling. And again, you can go to the IRS website, irs.gov. You can look at stuff on their website. They have a lot of information there, a lot of forms and stuff like that. You can look at and look at the forms and they ask questions. But also the other thing, again, partner with the people who prepare it. They will help you through. If you're not sure on things, ask them. You know, paid a few bucks and yet you have 100%. If something happens, you have, you have somebody you can go to and ask for help, you ask for assistance. Uh, mileage and gas ex expenses can't ex uh, exceed what you brought home at the end of the year. This is true on a personal vehicle, but again, that's one of the things you got to talk to a tax professional because if you're going beyond what you're what you're bringing in, uh, that could be a bad thing. But again, talk to a professional because every 
area is different. Everything is different. Like during COVID, it was totally different then. And the laws were a little different versus now and before COVID. So that's the thing is, again, this is why going back to a accountant, a tax professional, knowing someone who does this and they can guide you through it, just like DJ Brentley has a guy who guides him, just like you know Jeff has his uh, person, uh, Dwayne's got their person, uh, Tommy's got their person, we have our person, and then Matt, what about you? What are some of the things you do to get ready for uh, tax season? Uh, my person is a man called TurboTax, sponsored by Intuit. Uh, I uh, I use TurboTax. I've done it for the past uh, since COVID, so since 2021. Um, and uh, I think I pay like it's like 150 or 170 or maybe it's more. I don't know. I pay for like the single business owner type expense, and uh, they kind of since they have all your numbers from the year prior and all your expenses, you just update it with the new totals and boom, boom, boom. You can scan with your phone, all your, uh, 1099s. Is that what they call them? W2. I don't know. Whatever, whatever the 1099s, right? Yeah. There's 1099s or W2s. There's all whatever the, whatever the ones that you get back from companies telling you how much you made. 1099s. Uh, yeah. So you scan all those. Um, and that's pretty much it. And I, I always, uh, I write off a lot more than might be legally acceptable, but it's within, it's justifiably within reason as a business expense. So, you know, if I'm eating a meal on the way to a wedding, I call that a business expense. If I'm, uh, you know, all the gear, obviously, but marketing, um, website hosting, uh, gas, I do, I do the write off for the vehicle. I do all of them. So I've never had to pay tax, um, but I probably will this year because this is the first year, this is the first full year that I haven't had a actual job besides DJing. So uh, we'll see what we're in store for. But I, but with TurboTax, what's nice is you can kind of, you know, add, they always tell you like, oh, did you write, did you use our services to help you find more things to lower your tax, uh, tax due? So um, they're all for kind of not fudging the numbers, but kind of, you know, making them work in your favor. So as you update things, you could see your total tax liability drop. And uh, as long as you're in that low audit risk, they have like a, the service I pay for guarantees that they'll have a representative. If I were to get audited, knock on wood, uh, they have a representative that will defend you. Um, it's part of the package that I pay for. So um, that's what I use. Um, a lot, of, a lot of software also has uh, support. You can ask questions. They have, prof yeah, if you depend what, what package you pick, uh, they yeah. they have professionals you can contact and ask questions. But again, going back to it, what did I say before? Make sure you talk to people. Make sure you talk and you get the information and get everything correct. Because the last thing you want to do is put yourself in the wrong place. Saying, "Oh well, they said no." Talk to a tax professional. Talk to a tax professional. You have a question. IRS, irs.gov talk to a tax professional look at your own state's you know tax system what your uh, department of revenue is for your state and then go okay fine great what is that what what do i need to do for them so forth and so on because every state is different 50 states and if you're in another country if you're in canada or you're in somewhere else your tax system is totally different and uh, what we're talking about here is like you know apples and oranges you may not be able to do the same things we can do here in the U.S. as you can in another country. So make sure that when you're looking at this saying, hey, what about this, with that, just, you know, again, talk to a tax professional. <laughs> and again, the softwares are great because, again, a lot of times they have support and so forth uh, there. But again, if you've got a question, make sure that you pay extra if you have to, that you can actually talk to a live rep and talk to them beforehand don't do it. And then, uh oh, I got to go back and correct stuff because that's when you start running into additional fees and prolonging anything with the uh, with the IRS you don't want to do. You want to make sure you take care of it right away and you're always above board. Um, and then uh, Fred said, congratulations on being full time to you, uh, Matt. Um, I see you and I are full time. Brentley's full time. The three of us are. Um, Tommy is in college and he does it. Uh, Dwayne has a job and Jeff has a job, but this gives diversity in DJs. There's not every DJ has 
uh, does a full time. Not every DJ has a, 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 a regular job and they do this as a side gig. So that's why I like having all these guys here because they different exper experiences, different understanding, different areas. And this is why we have a great team here is because of all these different uh, people, they can give some different input for every area. And this goes to the next thing we're going to talk about is um, something I saw today. I was talking a little bit earlier. It is on Inside Edition. Uh, the video is up there. If you go to YouTube and Inside Edition, <laughs> uh, a venue uh, was having a wedding. Uh, the venue was there um, with the bride and groom. The bride and groom are out there having fun. And they're about 10, 15 minutes into the dance floor being open and a sheriff's deputy was there uh, asking them to uh, terminate the uh, evening because the venue had a cease and desist order. The other part of that is that uh, they had a noise complaint, which initializes this deputy to come out there because someone called 911 and said, hey, uh, they're being loud over there. And I don't know if that person knows that the place is not supposed to have music or if uh you know they're just loud and you know DJs want to go to 11 versus you know keeping it uh down a little further down but it, it's one of the things that I totally believe the venue is the main culprit in this especially they have a cease and desist they should have refunded the the, the couple way beforehand and help them get a different venue and for them to fix where we need to fix to get back up and running this is something that's a, a bad venue owner and I also a little bit, and again, a little, uh, kind of blame the DJ a little bit because, again, how loud were you playing? I was not there. I'm going by what's on the video, what they're talking about. I don't know what the sound level was. I don't know how close the nearest house is. It's an outdoor venue. It's in Arizona, out in the desert somewhere. When they did the wedding, they had cactuses behind them. Um, so there's a lot of variables, a lot of questions that I have. But when a DJ, it, when they have a noise complaint and you're the only one making the music, you got to say, mm, are you a little too loud for that? So my question is for you guys, uh, it's a twofold question. First thing first, how do you how do you monitor your sound level, especially your outdoors or you're at a venue that has sound restrictions? How do you monitor your sound levels? And then the second part is that, have you run into a venue that is less than scrupulous? You have you run into that uh, place that you go that you see, and it's like, yeah, they're kind of they're kind of shady. I don't want to go back to this venue again because this, unfortunately, this venue, this this couple is not happy one bit. Uh, the fact that uh, they had their wedding shut down because of this, you know, place is not doing what they're supposed to be do and take care of the customer. So, um. I'm gonna start with uh, I'm gonna start getting with Jeff with this one here. Um, what do you do for uh, monitoring your sound levels? And have you seen a few venues that you're like, uh, yeah, this this venue is not above board? Uh, well, yeah. To begin with, I I just pulled it up on my iPhone. Um, this is just an app, uh, sound level app that um, tells you what uh, what you're reading, you know, at any given moment. Accuracy is you know as good as it's uh, whatever it's made from, but uh, it, it works. I mean, it's you know if you're pounding some bass, you know the secret we all know is like you could um, where you hold the phone is gonna you know show you exactly what you're getting or what you're not getting. Um, you know, and one of the things is uh, you know it, if you need to show that you're under a certain dB level, yeah, you can hold it. You know, depending on where you hold it, you, know, it, you can manipulate it to to whatever you want to show. But it it is a good um, it's good to have. It's better to have than not to have, uh, especially if you need to show an event or a venue person that you know. They, here's where we are. You know, this is where this is what we're reading. Uh, yes, I have had um, uh, on one occasion uh, one venue that uh, told me that I had to keep it. Uh, at a certain level, and we had to cut it off at ten o'clock, which was no big deal. That's when we had uh, planned the um, planned the evening to stop anyhow, uh, and it was because they had a very nice neighborhood that butted right up against them, and these were very very big houses, and you know probably had some attorneys living in there. Um, 
but uh you know it, it is what it is you know, they, like like we have discussed before more and more of these you know i guess barn type venues are popping up around the country everybody wants to be a venue operator and you know they're in areas that uh, you know maybe 50 years ago 100 years ago they were out in the middle of the country and now they've got uh houses popping up all around them so they've got to watch you know what they're doing and uh and be respectful of their neighbors and you know that's one thing that you know, for, for this couple that, uh, that you were referring to, I think it's about in Arizona, you know, the, the venue is responsible for that because they had multiple, from what I read, multiple, um, uh, noise complaints in the past. And, uh, we're told that they did not have a, a license and yet they still took money from this couple to host their, uh, you know, their wedding and, and then got shut down. So I would, uh, if I were that couple, uh, to take it right back to them and um, say, hey, you know, I want, if not all, but most of my money back from that. So, so I, yeah, I definitely, anyhow, I definitely would say yes. I would definitely say the, the venue needs to pay them and also probably pay them for the whole entire wedding, including all the venue and uh, the DJ and photographer and caterer and whatever else they have there because that wedding is ruined. And the other part of that yes. is, again, if you're a venue owner, you should know that you have a cease and desist order, you should not be hosting anything. And again, helping couples get other venues to have them for a special day and not keep money. It's some of these owners, I just don't understand their business. Uh, DJ Brentley was talking about uh, how he knows in the city of Chicago, uh, if, okay. you're, if you have a venue, can I exceed 60 dB? Um, yep. If if you guys didn't know, know this, uh, DJ Bradley is from the city. He's actually a little further in the city than I grew up in. I grew up in the far northwest side of the city. He grew up in the north side. And the other part is that his father actually owned a bar. And yep. Bradley was also in band. So he knows that fairly well for working as, being in some of the venues in the city, as well as his father owning a uh, establishment and how the city of Chicago and like most major cities will come after you and say, because they don't want the Yelderman in the city of Chicago or government in any area do not want to hear complaints from a local residents that this venue is a pain in the rear end and they they hear stuff. Now, some people are, are oversensitive and complain about everything. Uh, I've run into the venues like that. There's one venue up north on the Illinois Wisconsin border. Uh, it's a beautiful winery. Uh, they have a person that lives two miles down the road. Uh, if she drives by and hears any music outside, she will call the sheriff's department. Um, the sheriff comes out, sounds always below the threshold, but she goes to the board meeting there and complains to the board all the time because she wants the venue shut down because she doesn't feel a venue like that should be anywhere in her area. And again, she's two miles down the road in the area it's at. It's all farm country. This is a vineyard and next to it is a, it is basically a uh, was a soy field when I was there last, and they had a cornfield on the other side. So this is something that you know people sometimes claim about things they shouldn't be complaining about. Um, so I'm going to go to the next person here, uh, Matt in California. I know we were talking about this earlier. Uh, what do you do to kind of you know see what you're at for volume level and stuff, and as well as do you what have you worked or seen some. Uh, shady uh, venue owners that you're like, yeah, I do not want to come back to this venue because they're not following what they're supposed to, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing to take care of the customer. Uh, so I have a decibel reader. Um, I rarely use it unless the venue has a decibel limit. Um, but then again, I usually don't DJ at venues that have a decibel limit. Um, so uh, that usually takes care of that. Uh, I do though... It's hard because in my booth, I have a monitor. So obviously it's going to be much louder there than it is going to be at the back of the dance floor where they're probably going to take the measurement. Usually it's at property line anyway. Um, so I, I always, if there is a decibel limit, I usually work with whoever's there and just kind of like set where my max is going to be so that that way I know like, hey, as long as I'm under this, I'm fine. And that usually takes care of that. Um, but I don't, yeah, that's, there's been some venues where uh, you've heard me in the past that I just do not want to come back to because they're just, the the limit is just so low that it's just unfair to us. So, um, 
There's a there's a handful that I just refuse to go back. There's one that doesn't allow subwoofers, which is annoying because um, I know that a guy on their preferred list always brings his Evox system. And I think the girl at the venue is just not smart enough to realize that those are subwoofers. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I don't know. There's certain venues that I'm just like, yeah, I don't need to come back there. That's it. I, I'm good with... Uh, Uh, most most we don't really run into here. It, it's certain cities like Palm Springs. Everybody there is a retiree uh, or is, um, yeah, it's a very retire, retired place to live. So they don't like loud music. Um, and then there's also uh, certain area like residential. I don't usually do residential weddings if it's in your backyard or at some Airbnb. I usually don't do those um, for the same reasons because... They don't really think about it. And they say, oh, we've told all the neighbors. Yeah, well, I'm sure the neighbors are not going to be happy to hear pounding music at 930 uh, when they're trying to, you know, enjoy their nice house. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the hard part. It's and, you know, I'm reading some of the comments here in um, in the chat here. One of the things is one uh, uh, someone's asking about day or night levels, and I'm sure it's about uh with uh, DJ Brightly, but also sometimes it depends on the municipality, you know, like, you know, where I'm at is totally different from the city of Chicago. I'm 30 miles West out in DuPage County and things are done differently here in the village I live in uh, versus the unincorporated areas of DuPage County. And it is totally different than versus down in Chicago, you're on, you know, on Lincoln and Clark, you know, which is uh kind of a, a lot of bars are over there. But also, it's, it's you have a lot of apartments right above the bars. You have apartments right next door. You have condos, you know, two, three million dollar condos across the street from a venue. They have much more different restrictions than I have here. So it's always different from area to area, too. And that's why I said that, you know, again, going by what I saw in the video, and again, we go do a little more digging in there and read some more. But the thing is that on the surface, if everything is true, again, this is allegedly from coming from the couple. If that is true, and this is what the news you know, is reporting, um, the, again, this venue really did this service to the customer. And the DJ, again, they have multiple complaints. You know, Jeff read that, Jeff said he read that. Um, I heard some else earlier say, I think it was uh, Matt said that the, the venue had a few complaints prior to uh the season mm -hmm. assists. This shows that the ownership of the facility is not doing due diligence and explaining to the DJs or band or whoever's coming in doing music saying, hey, we have sound restrictions. I just did a wedding last year, uh, beginning of last year, uh, beautiful venue, and they can't be no more than 55 decibels at the fence. And the fence uh, is basically 80, 90 feet away from the ceremony area because the neighbor next door complains to the village. And it's it's one of the things that I try to be constant on that. I do have on my phone, I have an app and I do have a actual sound meter. So I had, I actually had this, the phone by me with the next to the speaker. And I actually had Tracy with the sound meter in her hand. It's a Radio Shack sound meter. So I go to show you how old I've had that for a while. <laughs> and she was walking around and checking and making sure. And we we're hitting about 50 decibels further out of by the fence and further out, but we never got high enough. And that's one thing, you know, being understanding before you get to a place that, Hey, we have sound restrictions at this area. It helps out tremendously. And speaking of sound restrictions up in Wisconsin, um, I know that uh, they're a little more lax there, especially in certain areas, you know, you have a little bit more a rural area, you have a little more farming. And again, it's like me going further West, out in Rochelle and stuff like that and Dixon, uh, they're not as restrictive as, let's say, Naperville or Evanston or Aurora yeah. or some of the other towns are uh, here. But the thing is that they still have rules and regulations. So uh, what do you do to, to check your volume levels? And then the other part, have you seen venue owners who are very shady, very, very much people you don't want to deal with? Oh, yeah, across the board. I've seen that. But how do I deal with venues with sound? Well, first thing I'm doing, if it's a event, like if I'm talking to a couple and I know what venue it is, 
and I've heard anything about it, I'm going to check with the venue while I'm talking to this couple, send them an email and just feel them out and make sure there's no crazy rules or anything like that. And then again, the week of the wedding, I'm checking in with all the vendors I'm working with and especially venues I haven't been to. And like I said, it's bit me in the ass where everything I was told on the phone was completely wrong. Thank you, Rustic Occasions, Loyal, Wisconsin. But there's been, you know, one venue that's up just outside of the Twin Cities in a sandy Minnesota called Stone Lion Vineyard. Beautiful, beautiful venue. But they have that neighbor that is directly, you know, a mile down the road, mile and a half down the road, that expects it to be pure silent all the time. And one good thing about that is uh, in that county in Minnesota, you have to have a sheriff's officer present on site during the wedding. So in this county, you have to go to the, you know, in addition to your license and all that, you have to schedule your officer on call or on site. So you get a little buffer there. But Stone Lion, they are very clear about it that, one, there is a little red light that I just want up putting next to my booth so I can see it if I went over. I knew where I was. So what I did early in the day was when I got there, I turned up as loud as the red light would let me. So, and at that point, I knew I couldn't turn any louder. And with that, it also kind of, if everybody else started yelling and screaming during the dance, not my problem now. It's everyone else. You can't tell you know, 100 people to shut up, it's not going to work. But in that same thing in the venue, they, they hadn't told the couple anything about the sound restrictions or about a couple of liquor restrictions at, you know, time of signing. So it was slightly maybe shady. I don't know. But the couple didn't know that um, if you didn't pay for a bartender that was their staff and you only had a friend doing it, you couldn't bring in hard liquor and this and that and the other. And that's one of the things with like barn venues and, you know, vineyards that they're doing things a little bit differently. It's a little bit cheaper for the couple. They're trying to skirt around things. And I noticed that with a lot of barn venues that they do try to skirt around the rules and the regulations of what the state has to offer. And this year, Wisconsin passed an order, a law that if you do more than I think it's four weddings in your barn a year, you now have to get a legitimate state liquor license and liquor license for your county. So with that, everything that you were skirting past before, you can no longer do. So a lot of these barn venues are now you know, freaking out and ranting and raving about it, but it's leveling the playing field. So everybody that is doing you know, their due diligence and following the letter of the law is on the same level as you. So there is a lot of that. And, you know, I have definitely seen, like, one, I posted my gig log about it. The electrical was so shady, and yet the owners didn't want to do anything about it. And which, yeah, that thing was hot-wired, like, you know, things like that. I had to strip down my gear that day. Or, you know, like a venue that says, hey, we have a noise ordinance, but don't tell you until you show up. But when I show up, my and you can't use subwoofers, well, guess what? They're coming in. I'm not leaving them in my car. And unless you want my speakers on the floor and you get to tell the couple what's going on. And for venues like that, oh, you're damn right. I'm turning those subs on. As soon as we start to dance, I'm kicking those on and I'm going to tear up, period. Because it's not like I want to go back to that venue. If you're telling me that, you know, the day of, even when I've advanced everything with you, yeah, we're not a good fit to do business together. And that, that's, one of, that's one of the things also is talking to the venue and I, real quickly, I, I want to see a show of hands here. And I, I, this is what I do. I usually call a week or two advance of the facility, ask me you know, a copy of insurance, you know, what are, are there sound restrictions? I ask them a bunch of questions. And this way, when I have a meeting with the customer before uh, their wedding and have them proof the music, I've already talked to their co point of contact and I have information. And there is any additional sound restrictions, or if the venue I know that has sound restrictions, I'm telling beforehand, because that's one of the questions I have over here. Do I, you know, explain to the customer uh, that there's sound restrictions there? I try to be upfront with people as much as possible, but really quickly here, who here actually calls the venue up, talks to the venue and asks questions about the venue? Um, I know I do. Jeff, 
it depends. Everyone here. If they're doing like a laser package and I need clearance to use fog or haze, like I have a venue uh, that I just worked at and I had asked them about that because I have two couples coming up that both have a laser package and the venue owner had never heard of Firewatch before, even though it's a bougie venue. And so I have a call with her this week to go over that because obviously they can get it. Just call the fire department and pay four or five hundred bucks, whatever it is. But she's just never had that come up before. So in those instances, yes. Uh, if it's somewhere I've never worked before, though, I'll scope it out on Google. Um, and I just assume if there is no rules and regulations for me to sign that there is no noise ordinance. <laughs> so that's uh, maybe a dangerous assumption, but... Uh, you know, I'm not paid to go back. What they say it. about assumptions, <laughs> Dwayne? Um, what about I'm you, with, sir? I'm with Brentley though. If if the venue has a unrealistic noise limit or no subwoofer rule, then why would I want to go back? Exactly. You know? That's that's I'm right there with you, Dwayne. What about you, sir? What what do you do to uh, monitor your volume level? And have you seen or have you dealt with venue owners that are? questionable to say the least i wouldn't say they were questionable i just had two venues that um asked me um not to bring my um subwoofer in because i guess they don't they don't like the pounding one was like a uh, old old um storefront that was on a strip so they had a that's that little city part had a um ordinance and the other one was a pizzeria where they didn't mind the music playing. They just don't, they didn't want anything to bleed upstairs. So basically, I just turned it on and then walked to those areas to make sure nothing happened. You know, I can't hear it. And then if the um, go-to person is around, I just check with them and make sure the volume is straight right there. So I do it the old-fashioned way, just walk and check myself. And that's that's an important thing is... Take a look, take it, you know, play it, see what's going on, making sure that you're following, you know, again, especially a venue, <laughs> God, uh, especially a venue you want to go back to, uh, make sure that, you know, again, you're following a policy procedure to venue. Even that venue you're not fans for, you don't want to go to, still follow the policy procedures. And the reason why is this, you may be able to, again, this is a may, working with the venue and they, they like you and they say, Hey, we want to be a preferred vendor. A lot of times I'll ask for feedback. You can give them positive reinforcement and you can give them constructive criticism on the things that you feel that are off. Uh, hey, you know what? I understand you don't allow subwoofers. Why is that? Oh, well, we're under a strict uh, sound guidance from the county or village or town or state or whatever it is. Or, Hey, I, or they go, Hey, I'm not a fan for them. I don't like them. You can you can probably say, hey, you know what? Instead of me bringing in two, maybe I can bring in one, keep it down low, and when the, for the dance floor, just enough to get the dance floor hot on the dance floor, and that way it's not filling the whole entire room. Have you thought about that? You know, if you if I can control, I can I know how to control my equipment and make it so it's not crazy, you know, busting out bass all over the place. So that's one of the things to always look at is you know how can you partner with people. And make sure, and I'm I'm glad to, you know, again, Dwayne, you you kind of do what we do, is, you know, walk the room, listen to it, hear out sounds. And, you know, Jeff has an app, I have an app, you know, those are the things to have. You know, Brightly grabbed hold of the little device that had the red light on there. You know, Matt is also, you know, has a meter and make sure. And the last person I'm going to ask is uh, DJ APOC, a.k.a. Tommy. <laughs> Uh, Tommy, I know you've been uh, doing the rounds of basically clubbing, uh, sporting <laughs> your White Sox jersey and stuff like that, and uh, running around uh, not just Wisconsin, but you're in Ohio and down here, and you're like doing the whole entire Midwest uh, thing. But um, what do you do to make sure that you know when you are doing an event, it's not too loud? Plus. In your travels, have you seen a venue that you're like, hey, yeah, this venue is not, not great. I I kind of feel that they're they're shady, and I don't want to work with them again in the future. I'd rather work with a different venue. Uh, so the same thing as like you and a few other people. I've got the app on my phone, uh, just like the decibel reader. Um, it's usually like when I'm at uh, a private event or something where I'm bringing my equipment. I'll kind of do a walk around the room and. If it's, you know, super loud on the sides of the room where people are going to more be uh, hanging around, having conversation, 
I'll obviously adjust things so that, you know, the sound is more focused on the center of the dance floor and to the levels that, you know, like people are looking for. Um, as for like venues, um, I've been lucky. I haven't really had to deal with any venues so far that are like real restrictive on anything. Um, and then beyond that too, uh, I've been pretty happy with the places that I've played for, especially on like the club and uh, bar scene so far. Um, I do think part of that though is because of the like investigating that I put forth ahead of time. Uh, I try to avoid going into a place like completely deer in headlights without any idea of what uh you know what genre of music is typically played there, uh what the um expectations are from the DJ perspective, you know, do they want me to play an open format set? Do they want me to play a straight rap set? You know, I I'd, I'd like to have that information when I go into things that way I'm not completely uh, naive to it all. But so far I've been pretty happy with the way that um, venues have been run that I've played at and I haven't really run into any problems. There you go. And just keep rocking that White Sox jersey and uh, represent the South Side Pride. <laughs> got to keep that White Sox jersey on, yeah. Yeah, we got to keep that. <laughs> now, and everyone here is a college fan like Brentley. Brentley's a college fan, but we still love him. <laughs> well, well, we might have a new ballpark coming soon, too. So, uh, I, 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 hope, I hope not. I hope not, because I saw the renderings of the one that they proposed that's on the river. No parking. And, uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. Give me – give me get, just – just give me Comiskey. I, I really okay. feel that uh, Ryan that Ryan Starf needs to sell the Sox and the Bulls, and the McCaskies need to sell the the, the Bears. That would make uh, things much better because I can recognize that the Ricketts who own the Cubs, their fans first, owners second, and they've done so much money and done so much to Wrigley Field and a whole entire area to really make it friend fan uh, friend friends a oh, yeah. uh, friend fan. Uh, uh, if I could talk right, <laughs> fan friendly? They really fre uh, fan friendly area, and they really made it really, really super nice. Especially turning you know, out the McDonald's and the, the 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 whole entire park out there, and that Taco Bellathon. I'm actually when I went down there in uh, December to see my mom, I went and checked in with a couple of clubs down there because if I'm going to have to be going back and forth a little bit to see my mom. I might as well make the most of it. And baseball season's coming up, and they have a lot of Sunday games. And those bars are raging, like just party until you drop on a sun on a Sunday. I mean, even harder than Wisconsin goes, except for at Packers games. So yeah, I'm, that's the area to be, one of the really popping areas to be in. Like even the Sunday uh, two, a week and a half before or two weeks before Christmas. It was Sunday at nine o'clock, and I'm walking by one of the clubs up there. It is packed, and they're playing like freestyle and you know house from the '80s in this club. I'm like, if I didn't have to go take care of my kid, I was staying there. But yeah, that's a hop and hop an area now. The Goose Island Building, which is now the UFC Fight Center upstairs, to you know Sluggers, which has always been there, the Cubby Bear, which keeps growing. It's like wow. Well, the Cubby Bear being right across the street from, you know, from Wrigley and the Ricketts invest all that money in there. Um, I can see the Cubby Bear just growing and growing and growing and basically taking over the whole entire block and just being that monster. It, it could be. I but, mean, you know, DJing there, I've done I've done a couple of gigs there. And the, one was in between a set and after the uh, in between shows and after the show. And this is years ago. But wow. It, it, there are literally pushing people out at 2 a.m. That's that's the way it works. And, you know, hopefully uh, maybe uh, they'll get some, some of that on the south side. But you do have Rick and Benny's not far from uh, Comiskey. Uh, best uh, Italian steak sandwich probably in the whole entire Chicagoland area. Uh, if you haven't done so, if you come to Chicago, put Rick and Benny's on your list. Uh, they take, make it, you can look it up on YouTube. They take a uh, steak Pound it thin, bread it, deep fry it, put it in their marinara, put it on French bread, and it is to die for. They also have a food truck, too, which hopefully when they start back up this spring, um, at least you get the chance to have some Rick and Benny's. I've been at it in a long time because I haven't gone down there for a bit. Uh, but really quickly, I'm going to ask the panel, 
Uh, I know the Super Bowl, which is past Sunday. I want to ask you, you know, we had a Chicago DJ there, a little small DJ, uh, DJ Cascade, at the uh, at the Super Bowl because he filled in for Tiesto. Tiesto had some family matters he had to take care of. And uh, did you? I'm going to ask yes or no, and this is nothing. You know, again, this is not I got you question. This is just a yes or no question. Did you happen to catch some of the stuff that uh, that he did? And were you watching what he was doing? And did you enjoy his little bit of music he was there putting on to the TV? So, Jeff, did you uh, happen to watch the game? And did you happen to watch Cascade do some DJing? Yes, I watched the game. Uh, no, I did not see much of Cascade. Maybe just a couple of shots. Uh, the party I was at, uh, the audio was... Uh, you know, the crowd noise was loud and you couldn't even hear the commercials. I had to watch the commercials the next day. So, uh, so I couldn't really, you know, get a lot of what Cascade was doing. So, yeah. Okay. But still it was cool. You know, you had a cool, you were at a cool party. That's that. That's there. Right there is a, that's a win 90 day a week. Hey, hopefully, beer is flowing, you know, and yeah, uh, you hopefully know, you, hopefully you and your wife are rocking out, having fun, enjoying it. Hey, uh, hey, Taylor Swift chugged more beer than I did. So, well, again, we're, we're adults. <laughs> we're not as young as Taylor. Taylor's uh, still a young, young lady. Uh, APOC. Tommy, did you watch the game and did you see Cascade and and uh, did you get a chance to watch a little bit of his mixes? Uh, I watched the game, but I wasn't. I don't think I had it on early enough to see when they were panning the camera on him because what I seemed to catch like on social media after was it seemed like he was mixing more pregame. Uh, but I did watch uh, videos on Instagram and stuff. I saw stuff of him everywhere, and uh, he put something out himself. He was like played. Uh, Played one of my songs to 100 million people this weekend because of all the people watching on TV and stuff. So that was pretty cool. That would, that'd be a really awesome opportunity. Yeah, he had, he had uh, four CDJs and a mixer set up, and he was doing without, you know, he just did thumb drives. Was doing without. Yeah, I think computer. it was four 3000s and uh, yep. one of the new mixers. Yep. Yeah, yep. I, was wa I was watching, I was looking at equipment, looking at stuff as a DJ. Always looking at the gear. I'm a gearhead. So I was like <laughs> speakers and lights and uh, of course, you know, I know how to mix and what to mix, but uh, DJ Bradley, did you happen to watch the game and did you catch uh, Cascade? I didn't watch the game. I decided that I had more work to do than anything else to get ready for the upcoming steps I've got. And I kept the score on my phone like I was watching the you know, score progress, but I just didn't, with all the crap on social media and all the, you know, am I a Taylor fan? Yeah, but having to watch her and watch all those hype around it, I just didn't have time for it. And do I want to catch Cascade what they did? Yeah, I will probably YouTube that and a couple other things from the weekend. But what I mean, I, I guess I thought it was more important to actually accomplish something on Sunday. And I also had a gig Sunday afternoon. So by the time I get home, I just wasn't in the headspace to watch it. Okay. So, uh, Dwayne, did you watch the game this past Sunday? And uh, did you happen to cast uh, DJ Cascade up there? On the wheels of steel. Yeah, I watched most of the game. I fell asleep pretty much after halftime. But I did I did see like glimpse of him, but I didn't really see him like they didn't when I saw him, he they didn't show that much of him mixing. So it, it, it was more the pre the pre pregame stuff was more and, and he was doing between at breaks, commercial breaks, he was doing the DJing between commercial breaks for the stadium. So it was more for the people there. And they were showing glimpses of him here and there, but they did have, you know, uh, a few minutes of shots with him with some music. And, and, and you could also hear the music when the uh, analysts were down on the field talking. Uh, he was doing some drops, and I was listening to the – I was listening to them talk, but I was also listening to music, and he did a really long um, – it was a really long ramp-up to each time he dropped the bass. I was like, that's a really long ramp up. He was just like going up and 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 finally dropped. I'm like, wow, that's pretty long. But it was cool to see, you know, uh, see him up there and uh, he, I'm sure he rocked the house. And uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately, uh, you fell asleep and missed the, the second half. I thought was much better than the first half of the game. Uh, just had a little bit more excitement because that, that first three quarters of that game just, just ached by really slowly until the last quarter. That's when it really started to key up. So you didn't miss too much <laughs> up until right. the fourth quarter. <laughs> uh, Matt, what about you? Did you uh, get a chance to watch Cascade? Did you watch the game? And 
Did you watch his uh, performance? Of course, we had a little, uh, not a party, but just a couple friends over, watched the game and got some wings and some other appetizers. And um, yeah, it was, it was good. I mean, it's devastating that our California is not going to have a championship, but uh, you know, it's whatever. I mean, I honestly don't like either team, so I don't care who won, but I hate the Chiefs more than anything, so... I was really rooting for the Niners, as was the whole stadium, um, except for the five Chiefs fans that we happen to see there. Um, I don't think anybody should be allowed to be a Chiefs fan if they don't live in Kansas City or Missouri, like uh, if they don't live in Kansas or Missouri. Uh, but people are bandwagoners, just like the Patriots. You know, oh my God, look how great my team's doing. I'm going to suddenly support them, even though I can't name a single player besides Patrick Mahomes. So, yeah, it was disappointing, but. Uh, They certainly have made their dynasty over there, that's for sure. I, I called it, though. I knew it was going to be – I didn't call the overtime, but I knew it was going to be – like I thought that the the Chiefs could have won it in the last, whatever, 10 seconds before they went into overtime. I think they could have – They I thought that they should have gone for it and just gone for the win instead of going for a tie. But that's just me. I, I, I was kind of hoping the 49ers would win because that would give Patrick Mahomes a chance uh, – you know, a target to go for for next year – and him not to be uh, – I'm not a big fan for uh, for Tom Brady because I, I feel Tom just – he's got too many championships. But, again, he won them. He did He did well. Um, Patrick, uh, you know, he won that. He Him and the teammates. Uh, you know, him and Kelsey, of course, are a dynamic duo. It, it's, 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 it's fun watching them play. Uh, now I just have hope for my beloved Bears for next year to – that uh, fields can do something and uh, see what uh, comes out of the draft because they're up there high in the draft. So we'll see uh, who they draft, see, what they draft. I did see parts of the Cascades show. Um, I, it, you couldn't really tell he was doing anything though. Um, just like, I mean, it's it's like any in-game DJ. They're they're really just kind of cutting to him for little breaks here and there, and you get a snippet of a song or two. But I don't think anybody was really like, oh, my God, this DJ is amazing. I'm going to go follow him on Instagram. Like, you know, I think I think the DJ idea, all the Facebook groups made a way bigger of a deal of that kind of placing than they should have. Like, you know, I don't think half the people watching this Bowl even knew he was there. Well, again, he I, I felt he did a good job and he did uh well, he was very, very proud of himself, and he deserved it. You know, being called in and doing that, and kind of being the, you know, uh, I feel he did a really good job at it. So, but it has come time to end the night and end the show. We're way over, but uh, as always, make sure that you follow everyone here. Make sure you hit smash that like button for me, please. And thank you all in the chat who are talking tonight, asking questions and saying things. I appreciate you guys all there watching, and I appreciate everyone who has been watching tonight. Thank you all for tuning in, and I'm going to actually go to uh, Brightly this time for the outro and uh, have him say goodnight to everyone. Brightly, take it away. Hope everybody has a great week, and do good in the world. Peace out, everyone. Thanks, guys.